Halo. Kok telha merans de? Jabir, can you hear? Yeah, hello, Dr. Ajit Kumar. Ah, yes, yes, yes. It's Dr. La. Yeah, hi, hi. Yeah, hello. Uh, hello. So, uh, so uh, uh, I think more or less things are uh, very clearly audible and uh, visible also. Is it from your yes. side? Okay, yes, all right. Yes, yes, yes. So now, uh, Doctor Doctor Mule should be joining us in five ten minutes. Okay. Uh, the first speaker uh, we will let Doctor Galati, the, okay. uh, the professor from cardio uh, from Italy, to talk first. Okay. He he is a little pressed for time. Okay. I had requested him to spare one hour, but he said he will uh, be at least be here for at least forty forty five minutes. So. So we'll let him go first. Give him thirty minutes for his talk, and then you know, followed by ten minutes of questions, okay. and then we'll we'll take the next uh, speaker, Dr. Bapat. The, the 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 total duration is only one hour. Is it a very fixed or is it a variable one? No, no. We can extend. We can extend. Uh, our uh, Anish has taken uh, the slot for one and a half hour. One and a half hour. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. We can extend the, it. Yeah. Okay. So, so which basically means let the first talk go for thirty minutes. We'll have a discussion followed by next person going gone for the for thirty minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So actually, not thirty minutes. I told him twenty minute talk and ten minute discussion. Okay. Sorry. All right. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if you don't mind, I'll introduce everyone. I'll introduce you, Dr. Mule, and the speakers. Yeah, as well. I, I think you can uh, do that. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll take the second speakers. Uh, you can take the first speaker. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, do we have any idea what the um, uh, topics are by the speakers? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, oh, I had sent it to Dr. Jabir. I don't know if he sent. He probably didn't send it to you. Yeah. I'll just read it out quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for uh, the for the cardiologist, it is so the cardiologist is from a heart failure and LVAD center. His center doesn't do transplants in Italy. So we will focus on advanced heart failure and LVADs. Okay. And without touching base on transplants, transplants. I thought we had. planning to do more webinar series so we'll okay. talk about that in the next week. so right. so uh, for the cardiologist it is acute heart failure cardiogenic shock and covid 19 okay. second is how to manage ambulatory heart failure and post lvad patient in a hub center for heart failure and tips and tricks to resume normal routine cardiology and heart failure uh, services so 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 just, so just tell me that to see that the, the first person is doctor Uh, Galati Dr. from Galati. Yeah, from Dr. Galati, no. So his topic yeah. is what is his topic? So acute cardiac. So these are the three things I told yeah. him to concentrate on. So acute cardiogenic shock and acute heart failure in COVID nineteen pandemic. Okay, all right. So so how to manage? Sorry. Yeah, and then two three things I've told him to focus on: how to manage ah, ambulatory okay. heart failure patients, uh, uh, and ambulatory LVAD patients during this yeah. pandemic, and what were what are his tips and tricks to resume normal services. All right. Because Italy is now uh, lifted its uh, lockdown, okay. and they are uh, trying to come back to normal. Yeah. And, uh, what about the next? So the the surgeon will be talking about cabbage uh, and COVID nineteen and valve surgeries and TAVI during COVID nineteen, and then uh, tips and tricks to reduce tricks, resume right. normal cardiac surgery. So it's simple. It's going to be more interactive, I feel. Okay. So we'll just wait for everyone to join. Till then, I'll just mute my audio. Yeah, yeah. sure. Thank you. Thank you.
Your speaker is on mute, Mr. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi, hi. So, Dr. Ajit Kumar is already here. Uh, we discussed the plan. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Galati first. Twenty minutes talk, followed by ten minutes of questions. He is a little short of time. He may have to leave after forty minutes, so that's why we'll give him the first uh, opportunity to speak, and then Dr. Bapat will uh, join. Okay. Okay. I will uh, introduce uh, uh, the you and Dr. Ajit Kumar as well as the first speaker. Dr. Ajit Kumar said he will introduce Dr. Bapat, and uh, we'll take questions all together. Sir, you have your sticker here. Yeah, it's my own. Anish, uh, once the speaker uh, starts speaking, please mute everyone else's uh, mic. Okay. Hi, Ajit. Good evening. Hi. Hello. Takmulai. So I think we are more or less set. I I I, I can make out that things are quite um, both audio wise and uh, visually uh, it's it's running fine. How is it at your end? Yeah, it, my, for my end everything is good. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Tala uh, also said it's fine. So I think that should be okay. So so uh, so let's get that once more clear from Doctor Tala. So just uh, tell us who is uh, doing what. Oh wait wait wait! I can't I can't just just hang on! I can't hear you. Are you uh, muted or? Tala is muted. Yes. Ah, yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah, yeah. So I just told Doctor uh, Mule as well our plan. So we'll yeah. start with. Uh, I'll introduce uh, you and Doctor Mule first, and uh, we'll uh, introduce the speakers. I'll introduce the first speaker, and then we'll get started with a twenty-minute talk, ten-minute discussion, and then you can take over uh, and uh, uh, introduce Doctor Bapat. the questions and the discussion segment uh, we can just pay, pick up messages from the uh, from the chat there'll be a chat window as well where people may be putting in messages and uh, this so you can click there and uh, pick up questions from there and uh, discuss those questions for the audience i think uh, i can uh, handle that uh, cardiology discussion side and you guys can handle the cardiac surgical Yeah, side. I mean, I I feel I feel let's not let's not keep like let's not keep the discussion section segregated. What we can do is generally, uh, you know, yeah, general yeah. discussion. Okay. We want it to be more interactive. Okay, all right. Depends on the questions that are asked. So so let the let the chat session have a lot of questions coming coming in. Yeah, I, you yeah. can say that in the beginning itself so that yes yes. I think good afternoon. Good morning, Galati. Is is that good morning or good afternoon? Good morning to all. Sorry if I interrupt you. I was doing a test uh, before the the meeting started. How are you? I am fine. Right, absolutely you. fine. Yes. We are also we are also doing the testing. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're just checking. We're just making sure there's no technical glitches. Sorry. For a change, we're just COVID testing. <laughs> Yes, yes. No, just ju just to see if all uh, all it works. Uh, there are no technical problem. And how are you? You are all from India, or there is someone in other uh, time zone? I think most of us would be from India. Uh, our other speaker is obviously from New York, so that would no. be a different time zone. Uh, so in India, six p.m. Six p.m. is in India. Uh, is, uh, about six thirty. Uh, six twenty okay. minutes past six. 
Okay. And in Italy? What's in the Italy, time? Close to, close to, to 3. 10 oh, minutes okay. before 3 p.m. Yes, yes. All right, okay. So we'll give it another okay. 10 minutes and before we start then. Yes, yes. There is some, uh, some topic in, in which you are more interested. I prepare uh, the discussion that we agree before. And uh, um, in what phases of COVID-19 you are now in India? So I think, uh, you know, India is a big country and uh, various parts of the country are, seeing, are in different phases. Like right now, I'm in Mumbai, which, is, which has the highest number of cases uh, for any city in India. And uh, our peak is supposed to be in mid-May or late May. Okay. So far, and so there are, so Dr. Ajit Kumar, as you can see here, he's in Kerala. And uh, his uh, state has actually managed to uh, get over the peak very quickly. And uh, they are uh, easing their lockdown. Uh, okay. Yeah, they just about lifted their lockdown, I think, last week. Similar to you guys, Dr. Galatia, didn't you guys lift your lockdown two days ago or yesterday? Yes, from yesterday we have, you see, this moderate lockdown that in uh, Italy does mean that uh, the people can come back uh, to work and uh, so more or less 60% of Italian workers come back uh, working and um, you are allowed to make, for example, a walk in the park close to your house for example for one kilometer and after you have to come back and also some individual sports are allowed but for the rest uh, it is uh, not you see restaurants are closed bar closed uh, the other uh, 30 40 percent of italy is still blocked uh, there are a lot of complaints about this there are uh, i'm seeing a, a, a situation similar to the usa because there are conflict between uh, the go the local governor uh, governors and the central government so because there is some region that want to open more some other that wants to close more and so you see there is the huge the reopening is the huge debate you see <laughs> yeah unfortunately the situation is similar uh, you know the tussle between the local government and the central government is uh, <laughs> uh, is, is also uh, prevalent over here okay so now, for example, um, I will give, I will talk, discuss the first topic, just uh, more focused about, uh, you see, the coexistence of heart failure in COVID-19 or heart failure in the possible COVID-19 scenario when we, you don't know uh, where uh, it is, uh, if this patient has COVID-19 or, or not. And also, you see, the most um, difficult complication uh, to manage that, uh, the, the scenario that uh, when you have uh, acute cardiogenic shock. The second point is uh, how we organized uh, during this uh, epidemic, this pandemic, uh, about the, our center, our, about our Art Fellow Center. We follow, I know our numbers are different from India, for sure, and also from China but we manage more than 1,000 and 200, 300 patients per year. And uh, we are a hub center here in Italy. And it was also a very challenging scenario to contact all the patients. And also we manage all the also post left ventricular assist device patient, some uh, little um, uh, sensible, uh, you see, uh, precautions and advice in the hygiene measure in this LVAD, because as you know, they are more exposed for a bacterial inf infection, but also, you see, if they catch this uh, awful virus, the consequence could be very deleterious. And the third point that is the very, you know, the very big question that we are in these phases, because now you see how uh, we are uh, on the, our desk, planning the reopening, the possible scenarios, how to how to restart, because we think, because the, the, probably the real uh, mild lockdown will start on the 18th of May, 
and we are uh, we hope to reopen uh, the award center from the 18th of may and we are planning now the possible scenario of reopening so maybe uh, in these 20 minutes i will cover more or less this uh, main four topics uh, after if you are uh, interested in other topics in other things you can ask me without any problem sure sure we're going to have i'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions so uh, okay. we will keep some spare time uh, for the questions as well Okay. Um, I think uh, we'll wait for another five minutes before we yes. begin. Uh, Dr. Grati can uh, check uh, if you can share your screen. I don't think he has any slides. Dr. I don't have. I sorry, I didn't prepare a slide because okay, uh, yes, I had no time. Unfortunately, we are still uh, in the emergency organization, and we are doing a lot of uh, shift. Right, we are right. hoping to because right. you know we are, we were named the uh, hub for uh, Milan. And we are only two hospital for three million of patients, because the other hospital that are uh, very much in Milan, we have uh, 20, 25 hospital. Uh, they closed all the cardiology units, so we are the only cardiology center together with Centro Cardiologico Monzino. That and we are opened uh, a emergency room, cardiovascular emergency room for two months, opened uh, 24 hours per day and seven uh, seven days per week. And so this had some implication, major implication on our life. <laughs> okay. Is Dr. It's, Nandagumar there by any chance? Has he, has he reached out to the uh, scene? Sorry? No, I'm just asking the, is uh, Dr. Nandagumar, uh, is he on the... Did you have any problem about the availability of PPE or not in India? Yes, in a sense, yes, we have PPE, but I don't think the availability is that uh, uh, enough. So, so we are sort of conserving PPEs to do only if it is absolutely necessary. Yes. I, I, I come from a state um, south and Kerala where you know we have not had. Um, Touch wood to um, zero cases for the last two days. So, so we are a little uh, more comfortable, but I think uh, Dr. Niran and others, uh, they, 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 they will need PP for much more than us. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mule, uh, did you get a chance to contact Dr. Bapat? I just got an email. He didn't have a link, so I just sent him the link. So in two minutes, okay. he should be online. Yeah, I did the same thing too. Okay, all right. In Italy, in Italy, uh, on Easter, they were uh, cheering uh, with the wine on a on a long stick from one house to another house in the apartments uh, uh, without social with the social distancing. Was it true or it was just a uh, joke about the apartment the the social distancing in the apartment yes so <laughs> they, they, on easter they were cheering with the long the wine at the end of the long stick and from one house to another house they were <laughs> ah, you know in italy we have a, a, you see a wide variety of situation <laughs> so there were you see rich people in huge uh, you see flat uh, uh, without any problem, uh, people, a lot of people in uh, little uh, apartment and also the people that they were close and started uh, to sing the song together uh, or having, you see, some uh, party very close. It's, it's strange. It, uh, it were the, um, very, you see, they were uh, difficult days. So that the people uh, tried uh, to invent, uh, you see, you know, using the creativity to, to invent yeah. some, uh, some uh, way to pass to spend the time to see in every in their life 
right uh, anish if you can just let me know as soon as uh, dr bapat uh, logs in so we can start it's already 6:30 okay when you when you give me the start i start okay all right we're just waiting for the other speakers that's it okay how long will you be able to stay with us do you are you and, uh, no probably i, I think um, close very close to one hour probably maybe not all the hour but i think 50 minutes because i think at at four i have another uh, you see a little call but i think that i will stay more or less for uh, all or close to all the meeting all right okay thank you Yes. Yeah, I can hear ah. you. Oh, okay. No, no, no. I just wanted to know what is the situation in Mumbai today. Are things getting settled, or uh, still the cases are increasing? No, not really. I think we had around 500 cases uh, in the last 24 hours. Um, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, so not really. In fact, there's a big cluster that uh, the local government just picked up. 10 minutes from where i live uh, 55 cases in one day oh, right. so so it's it's, it's not uh, really showing any signs of improvement let's see they are ho- they are predicting a peak in mid may or late may so for us so, so that means uh, a normalcy may be expected by early late august i would hope so yeah uh, earliest by that time yeah I don't know if you call that a normal case. Maybe ah, no. <laughs> under control. We may call it yeah. as, uh, because the life has to come back to normal. See, not uh, now. There is uh, what do you call? Uh, uh, we cannot predict when it can come back to normal. Absolutely. We are uh, almost fifty uh, percent. Not fifty. We are almost seventy percent back to normal. Today I have seen yeah, what guys, I have seen is you uh, all, did a great job in your state. Uh, <laughs> but uh, from tomorrow onwards uh, all the uh, this what you call the exp- uh, people who are gone abroad will be coming back by batch by batch they'll be coming in oh okay we are oh, today uh, by jabber today oh today they have come today I no no from- what is the what is the result today they supposed to be uh, there was zero yesterday uh, it was zero yesterday I, i i uh, today statistics i did not know sir so what it's i heard three, uh, just three cases today Oh. Ah, three cases. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, Jabir. Good evening. Hi, hi. Good evening. How are you? Good, good. Right. Okay. So, oh, yes. Good okay. evening, Doc Nandomar. Well, I think you have not. Uh, your uh, phone is muted. Doctor Ajit Kumar, should we should we start? Uh, Doctor. Yeah, Mujer, yeah. Uh, Doc Nandomar has also joined, so I think. Yeah. Uh, we we will let. Yeah, we'll start. So. Uh, it's it's already passed a little bit past 6:30 so uh, welcome everyone um, on behalf of the society of heart failure and transplantation uh, india we have uh, we are planning to organize a web a webinar series where uh, we are going to discuss certain topics each uh, every few weeks this is the first uh, webinar as a part of the um, series we are uh, lucky to um, have with us uh, uh two speakers from um, the world hotspots of uh, covid-19 who could share their experiences uh with us uh we are going to start with um, uh, dr galati and then move on to who's from uh, milan italy and uh, then move on to dr vinay bapat before we go in there i would just like to quickly um uh, uh welcome uh, our uh, society president dr nand kumar and our uh, uh secretary dr uh, jabir along with all the other uh, participants 
the moderators of today's session uh, it's me dr talha miran i'm a cardiologist uh, heart failure and transplant cardiologist in mumbai uh, dr ajit kumar uh, is a senior uh, cardiologist with uh, with special expertise in electrophysiology who's based in uh, uh, kerala and uh, dr anvay mule is a um, cardiac surgeon par excellence who's also a transplant uh, surgeon uh, from uh, mumbai yes dr mule uh, dr baba has joined but he is not seen as on the board here can we oh uh ha hmm. ah, here i can see him okay can you hear me yeah. welcome dr babat ha ah, thank you i i just All wanted right. to uh, i just uh, wanted to uh, dr nandomar would you like to say yeah. a, a word yeah yeah hello dear colleagues welcome all of you hi good afternoon yeah good evening to you everybody hello good evening to everybody uh, on behalf of the uh, on behalf of uh, the heart failure society uh, society of heart failure uh, and transplantation uh, society uh i would like to i would like I, i would like to welcome all of you <coughs> for the special uh webinar on heart failure and cardiac surgery in covid uh, days uh, covid hotspots and ways to resume norm normalcy as you all know see this is a global problem we are all facing the same thing and we have been and we have been uh, consistently Uh, trying to overcome that and we have been and in our area we have been quite uh, successful in controlling so far and uh, we have today with us uh, uh, two uh, experts uh, justice with galati and uh, dr vinayak bapat and today's webinar will be moderated by dr ajit kumar dr anvay mule and dr tal hameran before before wasting further time i would li like to welcome all of you once again the the guest speakers and the moderators and each one of you thank you thank you dr nand kumar so uh, quickly dr gusipi galati is a uh, consultant cardiologist in the heart failure section of uh, uh, san rafael hospital in milan italy his center is one of the hub centers for uh, covid-19 uh, in uh, his city and um, uh, his center de deals also happens to deal with uh, the advanced heart failure and uh, lvad uh, patients so uh, dr galati uh, thank you and uh, uh, welcome good evening and thank you very much for your kind invitation uh, dr tala and also for uh, a very thank you for your president and for all the indian society of heart failure Okay uh, yes um, as you know I here I am responsible of the heart failure center here in San Raffaele Milan and uh, with you this uh, evening I want to share I think some uh, hot topic that can be interest um, the whole the heart failure uh, uh, cardiologist and the heart transplant cardiologist and also cardiac surgeon uh, in the era of uh, covid-19 so if you agree with me the dr tala i can start with the first topic uh, yes please dr galati please start thank okay. you 
the first topic that I want to cover is the, um, the, the possible scenarios to how, how to manage the acute heart failure and COVID-19. And in particular, we also we will um, uh, discuss uh, uh, also the, the scenario of acute cardiogenic so shock. Uh, basically, we have to distinguish uh, at least uh, two possible uh, scenarios that we meet uh, during the last uh, two or three months. The first one, uh, the possible sc scenario of acute heart failure in a patient with documented COVID-19. In this scenario, uh, what we know now differently from what was, uh, you see, advised by the WHO at the beginning of pandemic, it's important we know to use all the PPE available during the management. Therefore, pro the, the first thing that you need is the protective mask, not the surgical mask, but in Europe we, we call this FP2 or FP3. In North America you call this mask N95 that uh, uh, translated is a mask which has a filtration capability of at least 95%. The FFP3 has a coverage of uh, uh, a filtration capability of 97 or 98%. After you need the full coverage from your head to your feet, and you need double gloves, and if you have also a protective face shield. Before you manage this patient, it's important that you are fully equipped in this way. Otherwise, you will be not protected from COVID-19. With this, with this equipment, uh, equipment, you start to do the usual uh, diagnostic maneuvers, as transthoracic echocardiography or even transesophageal echocardiography. Uh, regarding, you can put also, and we will discuss this, some invasive monitoring of the patient, but we will discuss, the, discuss this more after in the acute um, uh, cardiogenic shock session. And uh, regarding the therapy, Regarding the therapy, there is the usual therapy that you use in acute cardiogenic shock, in acute cardiogenic, in acute, sorry, heart failure. So uh, intravenous diuretic. And also you can use, for example, uh, intravenous MRA. Uh, we use it in this patient a very low, when possible, dosage of beta blockers. And usually uh, we can't use uh, ACE inhibitor or ARB not because uh, not because of the potential uh, you see interaction because this is not proved and in the, this was not um, uh, advised from also from the ESC from the European Society of Cardiology and from the American College and the American Heart Association it was uh, advised not to stop ACE inhibitor or ARB we usually uh, um, couldn't use this drug when the, we, we had hypotensive patients. So we use a very low dosage of these drugs or we can't use this. That I am giving, you see, our experience after two months of this patient that we saw a very uh, low, um, very quant a huge quantity of this patient. Regarding uh, uh, intravenous inotropes, we used when needed. The most that we used were noradrenaline and adrenaline or in uh, moderate to mild cases, dopamine when needed. And possible in some patients that already had a history of uh, heart failure, uh, advanced heart failure, we combined uh, noradrenaline or adrenaline with a low dosage of uh, levosimendan in order to, to make the, you see, the 24 hour infusion of levosimendan. Uh, I, I want to underline that from the beginning, because now we have a lot of professors and uh, a lot of genius that they are saying, no, this is something that now we know also other, uh, other specialists, anesthesiologists, uh, surgeons, and so on. But we noted this from the beginning. I remember from the first week of March, when we performed DECO, a lot of percentage of venous thromboembolism and a lot, for example, when we performed transthoracic echocardiography for example, apical thrombus. So from the beginning, uh, we observed that this patient had a high prevalence of thromboembolic events, like pulmonary embolism and left ventricular thrombi. Therefore, in all patients, at least with moderate COVID-19, and for moderate, we um, want uh, uh, we intend the patient hospitalized with at least uh, respiratory distress. For example, that 
oxygen mask is needed, in this patient, we gave an oxaparin or unfractionated uh, intravenous heparin, but not a pre at prophylactic or preventive dosage, but at anticoagulant dosage. Because this patient, we don't know now in this moment, now you see there is a paper published at, at least um, two or three days ago on JCC, that there is probably an, hypothe an hypothesis of endothelial damage uh, or dysfunction uh, mediated by COVID-19. And this is possible uh, um, interesting all the endothelium of uh, lungs, of the cardio cardiovascular system, and also of the vessels of kidney. So we think that uh, also if we are um, at this, now, this, this moment, we don't have any randomized clinical trial to use um, anticoagulation in this patient. Regarding ventilation, we now know, and this uh, I have to say, to be honest, that this uh, we understood this after one or two months, huh? after managing a lot of patients, and also this is the feedback from our, uh, you see, uh, uh, anesthesiologist, uh, to privilege non-invasive mechanical ventilation. And I will discuss um, in, uh, in one or two minutes now uh, what I want meant with this sentence, to privilege non-invasive. Uh, regarding uh, uh, instead the uh, kidney function, uh, you have to use the ultra filtration or hemodialysis when needed as usual. The second possible scenario, probably is the worst scenario, that is acute heart failure in patients in whom we don't know if they have COVID-19. And I can warranty that in this scenario, probably a lot of healthcare workers during these weeks of pandemic became sick because, for example, they didn't use the, all the PPE. Also me, remember, at the first week of, of March, because the WHO told, no, no, it, 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 it is enough to use the surgical mask. I, um, I, I watched an intubation of a COVID-19 patient with the surgical mask. Luckily, I was not too close to the patient. I stayed very few minutes inside the room. So uh, th this is the worst scenario because at the beginning uh, there were, uh, you see, as, as I told, uh, uh, not proper uh, recommendation about this. In this context, I always recommend to use uh, the same PPE that you use in a documented COVID-19. So use all the protective PPE. Also, because you protect yourself, but you protect also your patient, because if you became a COVID-19 sick patient, but totally asymptomatic, you can give the, there is the possibility to transmit the, the contagion to the, your patient that you may, you perform visit every day. So this is the, the, the scenario that is the most tricky and is important to use here, all the PP. The diagnosis and the therapy is the same uh, for, uh, is, is the same? Yes, you have a question? No? Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Galati, just one, uh, just one second here. This is just a general announcement for everyone attending. Any questions, please leave them in the chat window. We can discuss this after Dr. Galati uh, finishes. Okay. Sorry, uh, go ahead. And uh, the for, uh, uh, di diagnosis and therapy is the same of the first scenario. Regarding the acute cardiogenic shock, for the, uh, the, the first two months of pandemic, up to the beginning of April, we systematically intubated the patients, providing an immediate invasive ventilation. And this we made all in Italy. Unfortunately, I have to say, because I spoke with the director of uh, uh, the cardiology of Bergamo, Professor Zenni. Uh, unfortunately, in Bergamo, they probably we were the red zone, but pro they probably they see the darkest faces. They were the black zone because they. I, he told me that they uh, had to literally perform a waiting list for intubating the patient in Bergamo. We never met this, uh, uh, you see, uh, need because uh, we had less patients than in Bergamo and less severe. However, I have to say that after the, after the subsequently and uh, uh, now we know after doing more experience on this COVID-19 patient, the more you resist intubating, clearly, 
with a limit of uh, oxygen saturation between 75-80%, not more, not lower, because after you are obliged to intubate, the more, the bene the, the more patients benefit from non-invasive mechanical ventilation. We noticed that when the intubation was too early, the patient had a, an extremely slow weaning or went to bad prognosis because a lot of patients need more than three weeks for restoring of invasive ventilation. And you know, after more than three, four weeks of invasive ventilation, your lung has significant anatomical and functional change. If you have the anatomy of the lung after four weeks of intubation, they are completely changed and also the, and also the function. And they are very, you see, weak and kind to be infected also with sovra bacterial sovra infection. And usually when you have a patient with invasive ventilation for three or four weeks, in the majority of cases, we saw a bad prognosis that brought the patient to death. So we now know to resist uh, and uh, up that uh, uh, until the moment that we can, it's better to privilege non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Another maybe implicated with anticoagulation because uh, there are a lot of evidence now of microthrombi in the, you see, in the vessel of the lung. Now we are discussing now for this. About uh, the circulation support, we use it, uh, as usual the intraortic balloon pump or impella for uh, circulation support with good result, honestly. We, they get good result. And also we use it, the ECMO when needed, the extra, extra corporeal mechanical oxygenation when needed. We have to say also that when we use the ECMO, the result, they were not always, uh, you see, uh, good in terms of, of prognosis. And this is the first uh, huge uh, topic. The second one is uh, another important, uh, um, beyond the acute setting, is the, manage, uh, the, the management of uh, our ambulatory heart failure center, and also because we are a left ventricular assist device center, a post-LVAD uh, post chronic management in our hub center for heart failure. We basically, we manage per year, uh, just to let the people know, I know that the number from Italy to India, because the, the size uh, our is very little country, it's not like India, they are different. But in Italy, we manage more than 1,200 patients per year. That is a big number in Italy. In agreement with the decision of our central and local, and local government, we froze from the first week of May, of May uh, the, the planned visits, and we warranted the urgent visits. Therefore, we organized the center in this way. We contacted the telephonically uh, all our patients. And this was an incredible job, believe me. We did a screening via phone and based on the referred symptoms and signs, we allocated the patient uh, uh, may, uh, basically in three groups. The first one, patient chronically stable without signs and symptoms of congestion. In this patient, we decided to postpone the visit in June 2020. The second one was the chronically stable with mild signs and symptoms, and symptoms of congestion. In these cases, we decided to manage and increase the dosage of diuretics by, via phone with the possibility for some patient to have a nurse at home to perform the blood samples and after to come back to us for the result. The third group was the, uh, the group of signs of instability with signs of worsening dyspnea or moderate to severe signs of congestion. In this case, we warranty and performed an urgent visit within usually two or maximum three weeks uh, from the last call. Therefore, we allocated 80-85% of our patient in the first group. More or less 10% uh, of our patient in the second group, in the gray zone, managed by, uh, with, uh, by phone. And in the third group, 5 to 10% when we warrant the, the urgent visit. 
the main target that we had during these two months was to avoid the access for the patient to the emergency room uh, or to be hospitalized in order to avoid or minimize the possibility that uh, they became infected or, key, uh, or were in touch with COVID-19. Because as you know now from the lethality curve and in particular from our lethality curve in Italy, we know that the most patients, the, the high rate of mortality was in older patients and in patients in particular with three or four comorbidity. And the, the comorbidity that they were more frequent, the way there were diabetes mellitus, heart failure, hypertension or uh, coronary um, artery disease, and also chronic kidney disease. So we tried to reduce this contact uh, um, uh, in order to avoid the catastrophic consequence because, as you know, we have a lot of advanced heart failure patients with ejection fraction of 15%, and if they met COVID-19, for sure, they came across with that. Regarding the left ventricular assist device patient, we used a similar strategy, not very different from, from, uh, from uh, the previous one, with a, a major focus in this case to warranty the hygiene of the pump cable of the line uh, of connection between the, uh, the left ventricular assist device and the system controller. To minimize also, as usual, bacterial infection, we, in order to warrant total hygiene and also to minimize COVID-19. So with same precaution uh, to use hygiene of hands, washing very, very frequently, and also the management of the left ventricular assist device alarm. The maximal effort was made in order to reduce at minimum the left ventricular assist device patient contacts with other people, also the relative. We, we warranty, we told this, this patient to stay only with the caregiver, caregiver and no other contacts in order to avoid all the possibility that they can have the infection. After they can, came, you see, a contact via phone to talk about the alarm, how to manage if they have problem to manage the, as usual, the introduction of, the, of uh, liquids, maximum one, 1 1.5 liter per day. And uh, you see uh, probably the increase of dosage of diuretic and so on. But uh, the left ventricular assist device patient, we try to save them from other contact because uh, there is the possibility that uh, they had uh, symptomatic uh, nephew or young people, if they come in, in contact with, the, with them, they can uh, take COVID-19. And also we tried to avoid their access to the hospital because you know, we had a lot of patients with COVID-19 and the, uh, there is no uh, zero risk. The third point, the third point, uh, that Dr. Tala uh, asked me is the tip and tricks to resume the normal routine cardiology and heart failure service. And this is the very, the million, do, million dollar question, because now we are at this point, yesterday and today, we are at this point. During this day, we are planning a possible scenario of reopening from the 18th of May, 2020, because from yesterday we have this moderate uh, lockdown, okay, we, we, we passed from strict in Italy to moderate in order to do a test for 15 days to see if the curve of pandemic uh, still continue to go down or if there is the possibility to have a second wave. So the, this is the monitoring that we are doing now. Surely we will start the, the scenario probably from the 18th of May, we will start doing visits to the patients that we included in the gray zone. So the, the first group that we manage by phone with diuretics in order to see that all is fine, uh, they have no problem of congestion, we can reduce or uptake rate the dosage of diuretic and so on. Uh, and also, you know, another uh, category that we have to privilege now uh, from May to, to, to June is also that the patient that they need to start the new therapy for heart failure because um, it, it was expected now after more or less one year, just uh, less than one year from the presentation and publication of DAPA-HF, 
Uh, we planned uh, uh, to have, you see, the availability, uh, not availability, the allowance from our pharmaceutical uh, um, re regulatory agency, IFA, to, to have the possibility to prescribe this drug to our uh, heart failure patient non-diabetic. And we planned to do this uh, basically on from June, uh, from this summer, June, July. And now we have to think also to this group that we planned if there is the possibility to warrant this uh, um, new therapy that, we, as you know, reduce morbidity and mortality in heart failure. Uh, about the organization, we come back to the organization. For sure, we will prolongate the duration of the visits in order to warranty all the maneuvers of hygiene needed in these cases. So the preparation of the ambulatory before, the preparation after, and also probably also we doctor we have to, we we will have to do something or if there is not uh, another healthcare professional that help us uh, in order to warranty the maximum hygiene also using al alcoholic or sodium hypochlorite solution uh, for example to use on the desk when the, the patient put the hands or some part of their body or for example uh, when they touch uh, some surface without the, the protection because now uh, in, uh, in Italy, you can't go out without the mask. So the mask is uh, uh, mandatory if you want to move from outside uh, from, uh, from your home. So we, we expect all patients with the mask. But the gloves, they are mandatory only in the, on the public transport, but not in other uh, uh, context. So for example, if we don't have patients with uh, gloves uh, and they touch and we don't know if they have COVID-19 we after we have to clean uh, the desk uh, the bed and so on and the instrumental that, that we use so warranty maximum cleaning increasing the number uh, the uh, duration of visit and the third scenarios that now we are considering is uh, to use just a little that we are using now some tele telemedicine and some technological capability for example to send via mail or via app that you see a report of the visit for example to a patient not in order to reduce the you see the the staying in, inside the room of this heart failure patient uh, so basically these are uh, the main scenarios that we are uh, uh, now that we are discussing discussing during these days this is for our art failure center but for sure during next days we will discuss uh, uh, other uh, other topic uh, other possible problems uh, uh, before uh, to start the reopening of the routine clinical practice Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Galati. We, are, uh, we have a few questions already lined up for you. Uh, these are some questions from our uh, participants. Uh, what is your experience with tocilizumab in COVID positive patients and at what clinical stage uh, was the molecule used? Yes, as you know, this research on tocilizumab started from China and was spread in Europe by Italy together in collaboration with some Chinese doc doctors. So we are performing some phase two trial and also uh, the French group that uh, you see took the line of this research. They recently published uh, um, a, a very encouraging result on uh, tocilizumab. And uh, the design, the, the, the basic design of our trial was the possibility to give this um, uh, monoclonal antibody, anti-interleukin-6, uh, within the 24 hour after intubation in order to see if there is improvement. Uh, unfortunately, what, what is the, my personal experience is the answer of the patient is mixed. It's a wide range of response because we saw an impression improvement in some patients so that they improved so much that they needn't anymore uh, in invasive or non-invasive ventilation or even oxygen. So very much improved. Another great zone in which the, the patient little improved and unfortunately a zone in which the patient had no benefit. So it's very difficult now you see to 
to express a personal opinion. I think this is the very promising drug. I personally think this, but we have to know now what is the timing in which we have to give this drug because after probably it will be not uh, um, enough. For example, you see, there were two trials, you know, very little, not uh, uh, international, one from China, another from Gilead, not very, you see, accountable, that they um, uh, not good result on Rendezivir, but as you, I think, uh, follow Professor Fauci in USA, the, the NIH, the National Institute of Health in USA, they performed a trial 1,000 patient international, all Western world, USA, Canada, Germany, Spain, UK, and so on, and the result was very promising. So this, I think this is the first stone that is not enough for this complex uh, COVID-19. This COVID-19 showed uh, and incredible capabilities. If you also, uh, you know, we are cardiologists or experts in cardiovascular field, but if you are a little interested more also in medicine, there are some medicine um, uh, in uh, some papers published on nature medicine and so on, that they explain the very complex biology of this virus that has more, a lot of uh, capabilities more than SARS-1, COVID-1, and also uh, a lot of capability more than MERS. For example, they, there was this trial they published, uh, in, I think a very interesting research. They put SARS and MERS uh, in, um, in vitro, and uh, they were not able to infect the lymphocyte, or they were able to infect only used, using the very few receptor of ACE2. So usually they were not able to infect. MERS sometimes was able, but the vast majority no. COVID-19, that is a, a, a evoluted virus, but you know the, the most evoluted are able to infect more people and the lethality is lower. The less evoluted infect less people and the lethality is higher, no? In, in a macro, ma, microbiology. This use, uh, this protein S, uh, the S protein, that make a, literally a fusion with the membrane of lymphocyte and is able to infect the lymphocyte and to kill them. He is not so evoluted like HIV, uh, HIV virus because the HIV is able to infect and re reply his uh, RNA inside the lymphocyte. COVID-19 is able to infect, so it's able to reduce your immunity uh, system, good response, the, uh, not the natural, but the specific immune response and kills the T lymphocyte. So, the natural, the non-specific immunity is very much amplified, and this could be the basis of the inflammatory storm and the cytokines high level in this disease, that for sure it is, uh, there is a moment when this storm starts. And I think that this is the role of monoclonal antibody to stop this storm, but we don't know when. So I think probably that the future of the therapy, but you know, I'm not a virologist, so this is not an expert opinion. I am a cardiologist, but I think that probably will be an antiviral, a drug that is an anti-inflammatory drug and an anticoagulation. Probably in future, we have these three P's for sure of therapy in this COVID-19. But uh, you know the research, uh, the, the, the research is going on. There are dozens of trials that the European Medical Agency and the FDA are performing and conducting in order to understand what are the best therapy for this uh, uh, for for this virus. I usually I suggest I know that Dr. Tala follow me on on Twitter. I, I suggest this this paper published more or less two or three weeks ago on JAMA. There are it's a beautiful review of all the possible therapy that can help and that, that there are uh, trial ongoing. For example, if um, I don't know if there is a question on hydroxychloroquine, but I, you see uh, there are a lot of study and a lot of people also. What we know, because we are cardiologists about uh, hydroxychloroquine, that you, ha you have to beware when you take, to take it, because we saw people that took uh, higher dosage than the, than the recommended dosage, and they took at home. 
So they had an extremely prolongation of QT uh, interval, and they died from towards uh, of point of the point in uh, at home because they had no more returning of electrocardiogram. So my thinking is that when you have to start a hydroxychloroquine, you have to take at the recommended usage, a dosage, not higher, and you need to have at least for four or five days the monitoring of the QT interval because this drug also when you make the embrication with azithromycin you can have an extremely prolongation of QT and you can die so it's important that when you start this drug you have the monitoring so, I just Dr. Mullen, yes, sir. Uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, the results of the ECMO were uh, not very good so I want to have two questions on it. Uh, was it the late intervention you think that last last minute now nothing is working, so we we'll use ECMO. That is why. On secondly, the did you use cytosol as there is a lot of cytokine storm in these patients. So did you use cytosol in these patients? You know, we use uh, in our center there is this current, and we use cytosol. But you see, usually in our <laughs> care unit also in acute heart failure. I always talk uh, with this also with my residents that they strongly believe on cytosol and we use. But uh, as usually I talk, we don't have any, you see, prove that this work. We do this, but it's like a religion. We pray that uh, it works, but we really don't know. Probably, probably this drug, this monoclonal antibody, I trust more because they are impressively strong. Some patients, incredible. We have, a, you see, a subgroup of patients oh, that really. Oh, me, me, For example, you can make a comparison in your mind. You can make a comparison, for example, on Verisiguat that was published uh, one month ago on, on the ACC College, or yes, Victoria. Probably this drug is a drug that works in a subgroup of very advanced heart failure patients. So what we know now, now that we have to tailor, I think, our, our, uh, our therapy. Um, I, I, I strongly believe in this monoclonal antibody, and also I know there are very important uh, industry that uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, monoclonal antibody on uh, hypercholesterolemia and uh, hypercholesterolemia and so on, that they are trying to develop monoclonal antibody also for COVID-19. I strongly believe in this pipeline of research, but we need uh, you and at this time, we need evidence. We can do this, we can perform, then I think when we have this moderate patient, we have to give for sure anticoagulation and antiviral that at, at this time now we know that probably is remdesivir. And when there is uh, the, the patient that is going bad, uh, to give an anti, anti a monoclonal antibody. But uh, you know, we saw also young patient, I remember one five, 45 years old, that took all these drugs and after one month was intubated and ventilated, uh, you see, on the, his belly. He was lying on this belly uh, because it was extremely severe. So, you know, when you have the new disease, uh, we are scientists and we have to be extremely uh, caution because I, for example, one or two months ago, I see a, a, a great enthusiasm on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Maybe, but you know, we don't know. We don't have any reasonable pro proof of this. Maybe they can work. But remember, when you walk, you, you give a drug, in my opinion, always uh, warranty the, the safety. When you don't know the efficacy, at least try to warrant the, the safety. And this was the case because I cited hydroxychloroquine and uh, plus um, azithromycin. So I, I believe that the, in some months, I think in one or two months, we will know much more about this. Dr. Ajit here. Uh, Dr. Gladi, see, there, there are a couple of questions on the role of uh, anticoagulation. You, you have based your anticoagulation, uh, is it based on the pathology, uh, pathological reports that have come? Or uh, do we have any perfusion imaging to have any proof? Uh, do, we, do we know what are the pulmonary artery pressures in such patients? Do we have any 
evidence that the RE systolic pressure or RM dysfunction happens. Yes, so it's, what it's, it's a proof very, and thank you very much for the question. It's a very good question. We we came, um, we had two basically uh, evidence. At the beginning, when we started on March, we didn't have so, so much evidence. We noticed that something was happening because when we were called to perform imaging of heart or, or the vessel, we noticed an incredible uh, prevalence of uh, venous thromboembolism. For example, we were called in one day for performing echocardiography in 10 patients. And we saw eight out of 10, they had venous thromboembolism without any risk factor. And we thought, why there is this? Or we, we know, we watched there and we saw ap apical left ventricular thrombi, impressive, huge thrombi. Why, why there is this? So we decide maybe this is COVID that, that produced this. And we, you know, because that time we were uh, in the, in, uh, on the front line, in the war, in the huge emergency, and we decided to give this as anticoagulation. After, on late March and on April, we had the proof of this, as you told, from pat pathology evidence, no? And uh, this was my, you see, when I was talking, I re referred to this. A lot of pathology, they told, we discovered these new things. So this is not new because we are seeing this for five weeks. The, when they perform pathology, they found thrombi, micro thrombi everywhere in the, in the lung circulation, in the kidney circulation. Performing the cardiac, uh, so sorry, the CT of uh, thorax, we okay. see a lot of micro thrombi. Yeah. Now there are a lot of line of research from our anesthesiologist, uh, and, uh, you see pulmonologist uh, and uh, uh, pathologist on this. But we, you know, we cardiologists, we don't try to, you see, to become beautiful with all drug. And oxaparin is not the re revolutionary drug, but in this case is very helpful because, uh, uh, for example, we noticed that one of the reasons because uh, uh, non-invasive me me mechanical ventilation was not working so well because there were thrombi in the circulation. So now co combining the anticoagulation, we know that non-invasive mechanical ventilation has the more probability, probability to, uh, to give a, a better saturation, a normal sun saturation of this line. So also, if, you know, if we don't have randomized clinical trial, we are in this position, but uh, I can uh, tell you that uh, Two weeks ago, they, they were approved uh, trials uh, on uh, enoxaparin and or infusion heparin in our, uh, by our uh, re regulatory pharmaceutical agency. So the trials are going now, are going on. We strongly believe in the anticoagulation because we saw in this, we can say also better than tolicizumab, we saw the result of this. Uh, that uh, anticoagulation works. As usual, as you well know, I, I know there is a cardiac cell surgeon and another here. You have also always to balance, no? Because if you have a patient with uh, severe thrombocytopenia or patient that have pre previous, previous major intracranial uh, hemo hemorrhagic event, uh, you have to manage this situation. But usually in other patients, you can give this in a safe, in a safe condition. Hello, um, I have just one question that uh, as you are going to start your uh, near normal or new normal from few days in this month of May, uh, how is your heart transplant program uh, will work with this? That How will you get uh, testing of a donor and a recipient? Uh, are there any plans? It is a very good question. As you know, as Tala know, in our center, unfortunately, we don't have the heart transplant because in Milan, we have three centers close to us that are Pavia, Bergamo, and Brescia that they are allowed from the Lombardy region to make heart transplantation. Therefore, we make the screening and we, we are the main center for left ventricular assist device in Italy. So usually we try to work in co cooperation and coordination in network, for example, with Bergamo, Brescia and Pavia. And now, for example, we know there is a paper, a beautiful paper on JAMA cardiology of uh, two or three days ago 
that uh, when you manage this uh, a, a program of waiting list of heart transplantation with the potential bridging of uh, LVAD is better in terms of survival uh, with respect to left ventricular assist device as destination therapy. So it's better that we improve our protocol during the uh, when we perform a waiting list before a heart transplantation but we don't know as uh, alone by ourselves because this is uh, a coordinate work uh, a coordinate work a network with other hospital so do you think that uh, with this covid-19 uh, the countries like japan australia and uh, other some countries like uk where uh, uh, lvad is not a destination therapy but it is only bridge to transplant. Will that policy probably change because of the COVID? Probably, but I don't know. You know, usually this is uh, from evidence, and now you know that these uh, are not randomized clinical trials. This uh, usually, uh, you know, we perform retrospective uh, observation that you know sometimes they have bias and limits. So I think the best in this field, because in this field, we have to be honest, it is impossible to perform a randomized clinical trial because you are always aware of the patient that took a heart transplantation and of another one that took the left, because it's impossible to hide. Also, when you make, if you make, for example, a sham procedure, you can't, you know, and the maximum that we can perform in this, in my opinion, is a prospective re registry in order to have a better evidence but this re re retrospective on JAMA I think that um, push us to improve our uh, screening before and to mend our work with other center in order to improve the, the collaboration for sure the COVID-19 will change the hygiene measure that you, you have to perform a, maybe a serological test but for sure you have to search the COVID-19. For example, what I didn't tell uh, uh, before, but I will uh, underline now, in the setting that you have heart failure and, and you don't know the if the patient had the COVID-19, you have always to perform the test, the swab to the patient in order to know if it's positive or negative. This uh, is something that we will always include in our algorithm, in our uh, uh, program of screening. I was just thinking that if because of the COVID, the chance of you getting a donor is going to be less and then the LVAD insertion will be more. Uh, <coughs> Secondly, I want to ask, uh, what is your uh, uh, like vision for uh, COVID affecting the heart and the heart failure patients uh, coming in future will be more, you think? Probably yes, because we know that COVID-19 as the catastrophic event in patients who already had the previous heart disease, but he is able, unfortunately, to create a new heart disease in patients who didn't have a previous heart disease. In particular, we notice a wide range of myocarditis or myopericarditis that could be very mild. And for example, we manage this with our infectious disease specialists we talk about, because as you know, one month ago or two months ago, there was this uh, pseudo alarm that after was retired or um, uh, uh, non uh, or inside uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that they put potentially worsen the situation. So we share it with uh, our infectious disease to give to myopericarditis patient colchicin and sometimes corticosteroids. But at the beginning, we try to avoid the non uh, uh, steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. And, uh, and this is one, a myocarditis could be reversible, totally, totally reversible, as you know, and as you know, you can, uh, can also leave some little scar on heart and create, for example, um, a mild you know, and heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction and mild to moderate and so on. So for sure the patient with heart failure are going to improve. And also we saw, for example, that uh, COVID-19 was able to create an acute coronary syndrome. In this case, in my personal opinion, they were a, a little overestimated because uh, sometimes they were based only on troponin. We saw in Italy that this virus immune 
is able to increase the, le the level of uh, uh, TNT uh, high sensitivity troponin from 20, uh, 200 to 500. And this is not an acute coronary syndrome. This is for the myocardial damage direct because, for example, we have a study now from Pavia, la, uh, Professor Eloisa Arbustini, that she was able to isolate myocardial cell with inside COVID-19 is able to enter and remember and remember that the, the, the uh, uh, link, the, the door for, the, for entering in the cell is not only mediated by AC2, but this spike protein is a very, is the key. Now in London, there, there is a, a study uh, between Italy and London they are studying, they have, in London there is the unique synchrotron, there is a synchrotron in Europe, only in London there is this. They are studying the structure of the key protein and they are studying uh, and how to deactivate a protein that cuts uh, uh, S protein in order to activate. And this I think uh, S protein is the real key of COVID-19 is the real protein that other virus they don't have. Probably he took from some animals, from, from the bats, from the pangolin, we don't know, but he took this protein from some animals to enter, and this is the ability to infect, I think, also different species, humans, cats, tiger, pangolin, is very able, uh, very capable uh, virus. Thank you so Thank much, Dr. Galati. Uh, Dr. Ajit Kumar uh, will, I think, now uh, uh, introduce the next speaker. Yeah. We have Dr. Bapat waiting very patiently. Uh, yeah. And Dr. Galati, uh, thank you for answering all our questions. Uh, if you are, if you have to leave to attend to uh, yes, something, we, we, tot we totally understand. Uh, you can uh, do so. Um, and uh, thank you from uh, all of us at Society of Heart Failure and Transplantation. Thank you very much to all, and thank you for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye. The next uh, talk is by Dr. Uh, Vinayak Bapat. And I should, uh, first of all, um, wish him a good morning, because it must be uh, morning in the US. Uh, I must be correct. What is the time, Dr. Bapat, there? Uh, yes, indeed. It is around 10 a.m. now. So uh, he is the director of uh, transcatheter valve therapy uh, in cardiac surgery, and he will talk about the relationship of cardiac surgery and uh, COVID. <clears throat> Everything today is COVID, actually. <laughs> uh, can I share my screen? Yeah. Yes. You can share your screen of your slides with us. Uh, the host has to enable me to share the screen. Just a second, uh, Dr. Yeah. Bapa, just a second. Take your time. Uh, Anish, uh, can you help us here, please? If you can uh, put on that shared screen on the... Uh, the host has to allow me to do that. Yeah, Anish is, uh, Anish is working yeah. on it. <laughs> no problem. Anyway, uh, uh, till that time, I, uh, I think the previous uh, talk was very interesting. And as you know that uh, New York is still, especially New York City is still swamped with COVID. Uh, so. I'm just going to give you, I, I, I don't know the previous talks uh, in this session, so I'm just going to give a quick overview. Can you try now, Dr. Bapat, can you try? Oh, perfect. Desktop one. You can click on that share screen. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay, yeah, yeah, so we can see you, yeah. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you very much. And please uh, stop me anytime if uh, somebody has a question. Um, I thought the best is to give you a bit of background so that uh, then you know what strategies we are planning to put in to restart surgery as well as uh, structural heart in uh, Columbia, as well as most of the hospitals in New York. So if you look at the timelines, uh, these are pretty impressive in my mind. And uh, these essentially show uh, patients, you know, diagnosed nearly every day. And you can see that at present, we have around 350,000 patients confirmed in New York State uh, and around 18 to 19,000 deaths. 
Uh, so New York definitely is the epicenter of uh, most of the cases uh, currently being diagnosed in the United States. And what is scary is just looking back, it's um, barely one month or two months since uh, this timeline. Uh, the hospital structures, as you know, uh, it's pretty similar to India. I would say that uh, we have 12 public hospitals, which are essentially funded by New York State. And there are some uh, VA hospitals which are funded by Army, uh, but 44 big private hospitals out of which uh, three are really big, NYU, Mount Sinai, and Columbia Cornell. Uh, statewide, there are around 20 public hospitals and 176 private hospitals. Uh, look, population of New York is around 20 million. So I would say equal to Mumbai uh, or Delhi. Uh, but uh, we have had uh, a large number of patients who are positive. Of course, we don't know the denominator of how many patients are actually people have been tested, uh, but a rough estimate is 10% of population at present is uh, infected with COVID and 1.8% has presented themselves to the hospital. And of course, out of which 25,000 have died. Uh, we were completely unprepared. And um, when I say unprepared, it's the truth that nobody ever thought that this is going to be a problem. And on March 3, uh, when the first patient was, uh, or first person was essentially diagnosed, uh, this was what governor said. We can't hear the audio from the slide. Okay. So essentially what the governor was saying is, excuse our arrogance, but New York has the best healthcare system in the world and on the planet. Uh, obviously we didn't because uh, what we realized was we had tremendous shortage of beds within 15 to 20 days. Uh, the pictures I'm showing, the one on the left side is a makeshift hospital in Central Park in front of Mount Sinai. Uh, these are like tents which are made into hospital or ICU beds. Uh, but the more impressive is the ambulances which are lined up in NYU. Now, these ambulances are not just ambulances, but these ambulances had intubated patients inside them for one day or maybe even two days before the administrations were convinced that we need to open up more space. I don't know if you have seen this picture, but you know this became a big political war between federal and uh, state governments. But to be very honest, in the hospital, nobody complained. Uh, every hospital, whether it was private or public, uh, people really improvised. And here, this is a this became a really famous picture of nurses in one of the big hospitals in. Uh, in, in Manhattan wearing garbage bags as PPE. A uh, lot of improvisation came in. Uh, we took our resources such as 3D printing from different labs to give eye shields, face masks, as well as whatever protection one can give. Just to give you a background, I think coming and training in India and uh, especially KM training under Tendulkar sir for sure, uh, we were always taught to use the resources properly. And in in United States, coming from England, that is that I found that uh, there was a lot of wastefulness. Um, I'll give you a simple example that on a day when we do six TAVI cases in, in my hospital, each of us at least uses 18 masks and 18 caps and 18 gowns. So it's just sometimes ridiculous of how much resources we waste. The second mistake I think all of us did was we ignored the data, whatever little data was coming from China, Korea, Singapore. Uh, we ignored it because uh, it was very unclear in terms of how rapidly this is going to spread and how far it is going to spread. Far, I mean, is, you know, China is pretty far from New York, for example. So geographical spread was underestimated. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, we had real shortage of PPE when the wave hit us. We had tremendous shortage of ventilators. So all the anesthesia machines from everywhere uh, were commissioned into ventilators, for example. Now we had tremendous shortage of staff. I don't know if you heard that our governor was demanding 40,000 ventilators at one point. And the problem was you can get 40,000 ventilators, but who is going to manage 40,000 ventilators? We just didn't have the staff either. 
Now, there's a tremendous shortage of uh, not even trained staff, but even untrained staff to manage this patient. After around two weeks, we became aware that it's not the ventilators, but now actually the problem is dialysis machines. I'm going to elaborate on that a bit later. And then, of course, you know, the global shortage of tests and uh, how we do it. Uh, the emergency and ICU in the early phase was quite completely disconnect from what we were doing in the hospital. Uh, so, for example, you know, emergency ICU de de department was flooded with patients. There are patients in offices, patients in ambulances, patients outside the hospital. Uh, there was not much admission space there. And geographically, we were a bit handicapped in the sense that our emergency is near our pediatric hospital. So it became a bit of a logistic issue for us. Uh, lack, of, lack of medical equipment, uh, oxygen tanks, uh, IV fluids became actually a reality. Uh, but the clinical services, interestingly, that means my operation theater, my structural practice, my outpatient, in the first week was running actually normal because nobody believed that this is going to give us a problem. And then, ironically, it was around Friday the 13th uh, that the doom and gloom really hit us. And it, we realized that uh, we have to stop routine surgery completely uh, because it's the first day where one of, one of the operation rooms was converted into ICU. So we have two floors of operation rooms in Colombia and this must be in total around 50 operation rooms or around 40 you know, working operation rooms. Each operation room was slowly converted into ICU beds. There was an article written by actually one of our residents uh, who belongs to the New York Times family that the sky is falling and nobody actually took that seriously at that time. Um, some of us volunteered to work in emergency div divisions, but most of us actually carried our day-to-day -day practice. But in one week, everything got swamped. Um, and when I say that, that's a reality all the operation rooms were converted into operation IC, uh, OR ICU. Only emergency surgery was allowed. Each operation theater was converted into three or four beds, depending upon how big the operation room was uh, and how many oxygen, so to speak, connections were. Everyone was redeployed, especially the physician assistant, nurses, and technicians. Uh, we all those who volunteered underwent ICU training. So I, for example, attended ICU rounds for four days in a row, understood what protocols are there, et cetera. And a lot of telehealth and et cetera was put in place because obviously uh, there are no patients coming in, but there are patients waiting for surgery. Just to give you an example, uh, all the perfusionists were trained rapidly into CVVH and of course they were doing ECMOs already. All the lab technicians in the cath lab uh, were trained in portable x-rays and transfer of materials. And all the nurses in cath lab and OR are, were trained into ICU management. So four nurses will be supervised by a nurse who actually works in ICU. So you can imagine that within a week, uh, the whole hospital system just stopped. And at one point we had 90% of patients all COVID positive in the hospital. Uh, you can see this is in the corridor. These are not uh, delivery trucks, actually. You can see the two big white trucks. Uh, they're pretty long. Uh, most of the American trucks are pretty big and long. Uh, these are actually freezer trucks to carry bodies. And uh, this became a reality in our life that every day, uh, we, after one week, we forgot what is cardiac surgery, actually. We were more worried about uh, how many people are dying every day in the hospital. COVID testing is a talking point. Uh, as you know, that shortage was very obvious. Uh, initially, there was shortage of machines. Uh, then became shortage of swabs, uh, shortage of labs. So initially, whatever testing was being done was being sent to Atlanta into a central lab. And then over a period of time, we acquired our own machine but then we ran out of the swabs and etc. Uh, the prioritization was very clear. Uh, priority was to test patients who are coming in the hospital, uh, not the staff. And 
there was a reason behind this because we slowly realized that if we take a policy that you test the staff, we will probably lose a lot of staff because if you're positive, you have to quarantine. So essentially the guideline came as, you know, if you have a fever, if you are really unwell, and if you have a fever, go home, stay for seven days. And once your fever goes down for 48 hours, you come back to work, but put on a mask. And, you know, one can criticize this, but this, has, this policy has worked very well in our environment. A uh, lot of good things happened in this. Uh, you can see that this uh, a picture showing the last man standing. Uh, all the restaurants closed down. Social distancing started, as you know. Masks became very common. But the most important thing was we had a lot of donations coming through. Uh, and, you know, not just in terms of money, but resources. Uh, finally, the USS Comfort, which is a 1,000 bed floating hospital, arrived in New York. And this is a grim sign, actually, of things to come. Uh, and this hospital was essentially, it undertook all the non-COVID positive surgeries, not heart surgery, uh, but general surgery, vascular surgery, pediatric surgery, et cetera. Uh, this, uh, this ship has actually sailed off now uh, in last uh, three days. All the streets are empty, hospitals became empty, everything got evacuated pretty fast. We don't have an official lockdown in New York, uh, but everybody is following. As you can see here, on a busy day, this is a Broadway. This will be buzzing with traffic and thousands of people. There's absolutely nothing. Hospital is the same thing. This is the main entrance. You can see there's nothing except one vehicle. Uh, we, we suffered a lot, but I think the bottom line was there were a lot of good gestures. Uh, food for emergency worker poured in. As you can see, the PPE donations, a lot of our rich donors uh, went out of way and probably bought N95 mask at maybe even $100 a mask and sent it to the hospital. Uh, the more innovative things came, like child support, because a lot of essential workers had kids and now schools are closed. Uh, online schooling and Kids of a lot of attendings, consultants, uh, volunteered to teach other you know, kids uh, online to take their homework, etc. Coming to restructuring of the hospital, uh, it's actually even at present, it is still like this. Uh, our building was restructured. We had many wards which were taken over as ICU spaces. Uh, you can see that, you know, there were some specific areas where we could sit and, you know, socially distance as much as you can and eat. Um, we all underwent ICU training. We had to undergo, you know, some training to manage patients because I do ICU rounds at present and take care of patients, for example. I just finished six nights last week uh, into ICU. A uh, lot of us the trainees were deployed into SWAT teams. And I'm just going to talk uh, slightly because of that. Uh, you, can, you can see here that uh, th these are negative pressure operation rooms. And each operation room has got around three or four patients. Uh, we had a lot of logistic problems in terms of monitoring, et cetera, because you know, everything couldn't be wired that rapidly. Uh, but we have come up with some improvisation to uh, take care of that. Uh, ECMO team was normal in terms of, uh, in Colombia, we have a very uh, robust uh, heart failure team uh, with three consultants who manage heart failure. Uh, there are two super fellows and multiple research fellows. So they, take, they took care of ECMO. Uh, but more importantly, all the residents were deployed into what is called as a SWAT team. Uh, these teams took care of all the cannulations, intubations, tubes, and drains. And the idea was there was a shortage of N95 masks that time. So give it to very specific people. You know, they can do high risk procedure, high exposure procedure, and keep the risk of exposure to most of the staff uh, to minimum. Uh, I heard there's a lot of discussion on ECMO. I myself don't manage it. so. Uh, but there is a very good resource available on elso.org if anybody wants to know uh, what is the current mortality as well as outcomes on ECMO. Our own experience in VA ECMO has been pretty bad. Uh, VV ECMO has been marginal at present. 
the last case or probably the first case in united states uh, which was operated which was covid positive was unfortunately my case uh, i was called in by my colleague uh, in the night that he is going to do this emergency cabbage and he is sick with covid so can you please jump in and do the case so i went in i did a straight forward cabbage times 3 uh, balloon was inserted here low ef recent mi mild mr uh, post op he was doing very well but he developed st elevations which we know now that can happen with covid uh, but that time everybody said let's recat all the grafts so all the he went down to the cath lab grafts were patent uh, so we woke him up uh he was the about to be extubated and he stroked at that point uh so we did a ct scan at that point we found that he had a left sided a right sided mca stroke uh after some time he we called the neurologist uh, they took him to the lab for thrombolysis and clot evacuation uh during that procedure they found he has an additional thrombus in the carotid as well as well as right brachial so this was a patient who had no thrombus in the left atrium no thrombus in the left ventricle aorta was as clean as one can see uh, but essentially developed multiple thromboembolic episodes on day 3 he had fever ards swab was sent came back in two days as covid positive he went down further as renal failure but we didn't have cvv machines that time his wife came positive eventually just to tell you in short that he actually passed away on day 21 uh following this experience I, we decided that it's safer not to actually do any surgery other than emergency so patients who are on waiting list we put everybody together and uh, we classified them according to the urgency and of course the risk and benefit data was very minimal at that point and even today really if you ask anybody what is the risk of a post op patient undergoing cardiac surgery getting covid uh, nobody knows the answer because there is not much data the only data is from china which is uh, you know lancet paper which is on non cardiac patients is the risk is ar- around 20% of getting covid and uh, you know be, uh, getting a bad outcome with that our own experience actually has been minimum but other thing is patient expectations patients don't want to come to the new york because we are in the news every day every hour so patients are very scared as well at present uh, so we have now done two things uh, this is the classification of urgent semi urgent and elective patients uh, in our structural heart group and you can see you can add you know left main myxoma infective endocarditis to the urgent group uh, these are the patients you would probably consider operating in the current climate uh, semi urgent elective is questionable uh, so we came up with certain ideas and these are ideas which we have applied in our own setting uh, so you can see that uh, the figure on the right side of the screen is probably us where the covid curve is quite large and you may be you know new york like or you may be probably south korea like which is on the left side and then you can decide for example here aortic stenosis uh, where your tier 1 tier 2 and tier 3 fall and then make a rational you know decision in terms of should we treat the patient or not uh, honestly telling you this is pretty subjective Uh, so it more depends on what we think as clinical emergency and urgency and what the patient is willing to undergo as well uh, but this is a pretty important diagram and you can modify this for open heart surgery as well uh, so for tavi for example uh, we decided that let's do this uh, very innovative kind of diagram Uh, so procedural anatomy for example it's a high risk anatomy that means you are not going to get very good result versus ideal anatomy which is in the center which is you are going to get good result resource limitation if you have no resource limitation then that's great but probably we currently are into moderate resource limitation one month ago it was severe long term survival that means the benefit of therapy and then of course symptom status so you know the in the middle is emergency so these are just two examples uh, of uh, you know what two patients might look like 
So a younger patient with a life you know, expectancy higher, with who is more symptomatic and good anatomy, I think one can do the procedure today because we can bring in the patient same day and hopefully discharge the patient next day or the same day night. But on the other hand, there's a elderly patient who is in, you know, tier one from symptoms with bad anatomy. I think it's better to defer this because most likely the patient is going to stay in the hospital for long post-operatively and then going to get COVID and probably then going to have bad outcome. So for elective patients, what we do at present is we call them twice a week. We make sure they're fine. Uh, there are very few patients uh, who initially decided to go to, for example, Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic, uh, but then realized that the problem is everywhere, so kind of stop. Uh, the biggest issue we have currently is the outpatients who are still coming in. Uh, we see them on telehealth now, but the issue is how do we see their investigations? So patients have to send their investigations in advance. Then we look at the CAT scan and ECHO and whatever is available. And then we do a telehealth. So there's a lot of delay in terms of consultation. Uh, the problem is if after consultation, we think we need to get an additional investigation, it's an issue because as you know, that patients have to go into a CAT scan, then they have to clean the CAT scan machine. Uh, similarly, TE. Uh, so we are currently deferring everything. We are telling patients that in two weeks time, we will contact them. And we will keep in touch with them every week at present. And when the time comes, uh, we will get them in for investigations and then treatment. Uh, so this is exactly what we do at present. Just to give you an idea, in last one and a half months, we have done only two adult cases. One was a myxoma, one was an infective endocarditis root. Uh, we have done around eight TAVI cases, like today being the seventh and eighth case uh, as we speak and one mitra clip case. And these cases have to be submitted to a committee which approves them. Then it goes to a secret committee which approves resources. And then only we can undertake uh, these cases. So where are all these emergencies gone? No, you know, we haven't seen any dissections. We haven't seen nothing. So am I? So this is what the New York State graph looks like. And the same probably will look like in London as well at present that the number of out of hospital deaths have increased. And most of these people are not getting any autopsies or anything. So we, we assume that a lot of patients are staying at home and probably dying because of heart disease or some other problem, uh, but is go going unnoticed at present. When we undertake surgeries, it's very clear that you have, you know, if possible, uh, induction room, and then the patients moved into another OR to do the operation. The logic being, if there is any aerosol or droplet dissemination during induction, uh, people are not working in the same room. Now, this is a luxury. At present, we have four operation rooms specifically for these things. Uh, if you have that facility, that may not be a bad idea. Uh, we obviously have minimum staff, no laminar flow at present, because if there is a laminar flow, there is a theory that there's dissemination of droplets. So there's again, minimum diathermy use. And more importantly, you know, Columbia being a very good training center for trainees, uh, at present, all the operations yes. uh, are done by the senior side. Video, start video on the video start up. So um, uh, participant, so I don't know if, any of you know, uh, I'm sure most of you know, but uh, there are two types of N95 masks, the one in blue and one in which is a duck bill. Honestly, if you are doing an open heart surgery, my advice is to use the duck bill because it's more comfortable. Uh, the blue mask is a torture. And uh, last time I wore it for three hours, uh, it was really hard. Uh, there are a lot of counterfeit masks as well, which are currently on. So just be careful about, uh, you know, which mask you use, especially if you're operating on a COVID positive patient. Uh, Post-operative care is our biggest issue at present because uh, we have only one ICU, which is called CT ICU with bed capacity of 22, uh, which is non-COVID. Uh, but the patients there are from medical ICUs, hepatic ICUs, neuro ICUs, et cetera. 
and on the same floor we have two wards which are essentially covid negative if somebody becomes covid positive they get shifted out and the rooms get cleaned uh, so the main issue at present is you know the we can probably do surgery but then after that what uh, it's it's a big big problem the family and non essential staff is not allowed in the hospital anymore and this again becomes a issue because you know if you are doing a serious operation and then there is a complication or death of the patient how do you handle that uh, there was a big uh, hoo ha in the media about pregnant women coming for delivery uh, and uh, that has led to slight change in the rule that one person is allowed for few hours during their delivery and then they are shipped out after that uh, so there are uh, currently these policies in place as we speak um there are some specific issues uh, which we have learned uh, mainly about thromboembolic incidences in ecmo clotting of cvvh we were very late in doing tracheostomies in these patients uh, so a lot of our patients were ventilated for 3 3 weeks uh, but since the tracheostomies are being done now more frequently and slightly early uh, we have seen that uh, the ventilatory vein off is much better and probably with a similar risk of uh, droplet dissemination uh, there is still ethical question about resuscitation and how far one should go line changes you know normally you do line changes in 7 days uh, but that's not strictly followed at present and uh, all this essentially comes down to there is no scope of any elective cardiac surgery in the recent future and when i say recent future it's probably one month so the reasons behind this is you know we have to decommission all our operation rooms uh, we have to rebuild them because uh, they have been you know holes made into it there's negative pressure rooms built into it uh, we we have to reshuffle our icu we have to bring our staff back from wherever they have uh, deployed now uh, nyp has around 20 hospitals and lot of our staff has gone and is working currently in other hospitals as well and finally there is a fear of second wave means we can probably decommission everything and then new york opens and what happens after that and uh, i'm sure this is you know this is a frequently seen on whatsapp is influenza pandemic what happened and the second peak was actually uh, taller than the first peak so that may be a, that may still happen in in new york so our training has suffered uh, we try and use our zoom as much as possible as you can see uh, the good thing is that the total hospitalizations are reducing in new york and this is a graph showing that at one point around 18000 patients were hospitalized uh, the number is at present half uh, of course that means that lot of patients died as well and uh, the new per day hospitalization has come down which is very good because our number of death or discharges are now more than number of new admissions so definitely the trend you can see for at least last two weeks has been on the positive side and uh, one would say that you know hearing 280 patients dying felt like a relief uh, when the numbers were as high as 1000 per day so we are slowly heading in the right direction uh, in that sense so the reanimation plans uh, currently are we have multiple committees of course uh, but the main thing is about restructuring the space and bringing the staff back and generating patient confidence and then what we have done in in cardiac surgery for for example for tavi we select these patients we bring them on the same day we do nasal swabs in the morning around they come at around 5 am and then we get the results by 8 am at least and then if they are negative they go to one lab if they are positive they go to another lab and then what we do is we segregate them in terms of icu and we discharge them from there if if around 6 hours after the procedure if we think the patient is going to need pacemaker then we take them in and do the pacemaker at the same time it may mean that we will do more pacemakers but that's a reality to be honest Uh, we discharge them generally next day morning but some patients have gone same day if they live nearby and then we are currently giving them home monitoring systems like pulse oximeter and we make phone calls before you know night and then of course next day morning to make sure that they are okay open heart surgery is a more complicated uh, scenario and this is 
just a proposal at present more than reality. We are not doing any urgent or uh, uh, routine cases. Uh, but we have submitted an executive summary in terms of three levels of cases, as you can see. And this is the grid we will be following. Uh, we are going to try and manage uh, what is called as resources properly. So if, for example, there is a level one case, which is urgent and low ICU, it, it is probably going to get paired with level one case with a high ICU stay so that there are enough number of discharges happening to do the next day cases. And uh, we will probably get one operation room and we will keep operating uh, you know, around the clock and on the weekend as well, subject to ICU bed and uh, what happens with ICU. So our projection is we may be back in three months time, if not four, uh, provided there is uh, no second peak uh, in New York. Uh, the bigger and the last, last, this is my last slide actually is about COVID testing in staff. What do you do? Uh, today, there are, yesterday there was an article from one of the hospitals saying we have tested all the staff and all 100%. But the problem with testing is it's very confusing. Uh, we all know now that the nasal swabs can be negative as much as 30%, uh, false negative. Antibody, there are hundreds of tests, there's no standardization. Uh, so maybe, maybe this is what we are planning to do at present. This is a thought process. If, of course, you're, you're COVID in symptomatic and nasal swab positive, you should go home and quarantine. And then there are four groups of people at present working in the hospital. Uh, those who were COVID positive, but now have come back with negative nasal swab, uh, they undergo antibody testing. And if they have developed antibody and the nasal swab is negative, you are safe to come back to work. If, however, if your nasal swab is still positive, then you should repeat your swab in one week's time. And then if it's negative and you have antibodies, you are you know, safe to go back to work. Uh, if there's a risk of COVID exposure, for example, myself, uh, then I should undergo nasal swab. If it's negative and my antibodies are positive, then that's fine. I'm actually lucky and I'm perfect. Uh, but in my case, for example, my antibodies have been negative and my nasal swab is negative. So I'm actually a sitting duck to get COVID. Uh, and then, you know, what do I do now? Should I come to work? Because negative swab doesn't mean much. It means that today I'm negative, but tomorrow I may be positive. So I think there is still a lot to learn before we start uh, going back to a normal routine. Uh, so we don't know many questions. The good news is uh, the warm weather is coming and now the tulips are you know, blooming. So hopefully there is some positive mood, uh, but uh, for most Americans, uh, you know, warm weather and tulip is not important, uh, but more important is all the Starbucks are opening now. So that's definitely a good sign and hopefully it continues to be the same. Uh, thank you. Hello, um, beautiful Vinayak. Uh, very happy as usual, you are lucid and uh, very practical talk at uh, very experienced that is, I think the New York is a mecca of uh, the problem of this pandemic at the moment, which you are in it and uh, tackling our own it. Uh, you, you explained to us and you, you, you presented to us the case which you did of uh, CABG. And uh, my, my one question is that even if somebody is negative to begin with, and if he requires an emergency operation, uh, should we take the bronchial lavage before extubation from the endotracheal tube? And should we treat every patient as COVID positive? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think you are spot on. Uh, the, 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 the idea is universal precaution at present. And uh, if a patient is negative at that point, it uh, doesn't mean much because as we know that 30% are you know, false negative. But bronchial lavage has been shown to yield better results. So when we have done a deep bronchial or post tracheostomy swabs, et cetera, I think the false negative rate has been 10% or less. So definitely, I think it's more reliable uh, the nasal swab and oropharyngeal swabs which are being done are a lot of them are uh, who does it and how well they do it as well. Uh, so absolutely. 
the main problem is if you know the patient is covid positive should we do open heart surgery uh, there are so the current understanding is if if there is one and we have to do one uh, from patient management point of view run the act is high because there have been uh you know enough incidences of ecmo circuits clotting for example and cvvh clotting uh, there is still um, a questionable use of steroids during surgery for you know there is obviously a big uh, inflammatory reaction at that time so whether to use it or not you know, post operatively uh, the major observation has been uh, stroke and uh, intracranial bleeding uh, in fact one of the patients who underwent a emergency lvad 3 days ago a pediatric patient i just uh, heard that has had a massive stroke because of intracranial bleed so uh, we seriously honestly we don't know whether it's uh, safe or not uh, at present from staff point of view i think ppe which is critical and just to tell you all that if you have a n95 mask uh, you can use it for maximum 8 hours in one go and maximum five five times more so total of 40 hours you can reuse it safely that's the cdc guideline so please don't throw it away as you know couple of people are doing at present in our hospital we had to reeducate them that we still have shortage so as a as a surgeon i'm not a epidemiologist or infection control but as a surgeon what i am following is that initially the phase the was when the pulmonary problems were more then the cardiac and pulmonary were bothered then thromboembolism were were quite a lot and then the neurological problem because of thrombosis as in your case you presented it and also the uh, also the uh, the thromboembolism in the in the lungs which is giving coming up as a as a etiology or as a pathology Absolutely. of the problems yeah um, and but and yeah and kidneys uh, 30% patients are <laughs> renal failure at present renal failure yes and the kidneys so considering all this that uh, do you think that tower will be a better procedure uh, in next year or so for uh, aortic problems uh, our our view is completely that at present because uh, as you said as i showed you you know we have done eight cases now so our plan is to do four cases per week at present uh, we have com- com- at present commissioned uh, cath lab so cath lab waiting area was also converted into icus so now that's been decommissioned so those patients have gone up now so we have taken uh, you know control of that area they will be cleaned and restructured and then by next week we we'll do four cases per week to start with because the problem is anyway is we don't have staff uh, yeah. the staff has been all redeployed so we don't know where they are and uh, unless we bring them back we can't do cases and the good thing about tower is that patients can go home next day so yeah. it's a it's a dilemma but i think it's a it's a good solution dr rajit here fantastic talk dr bapar it this it, um, it it tells us a lot of uh, what what really happens on the ground zero in uh, new york i used to of course think uh, the ultimate mecca is uh, us but what really happened in new york is uh, frank has dissolution uh, some of us all the money in the world could not save uh, new york <laughs> so i think uh, this 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 there's some lesson which we need to learn i, I i'm not really sure what is that exact message that you should is it an anticipation or is it uh, what really went wrong in new york is it because uh, some anticipation problem and before uh, like, yeah partly yes but even if we had anticipated it to be honest uh, the the flood of cases was just too rapid and uh, you know as i when people ask me you know about the second wave i feel that the uh, susceptible population has already shown themselves now so the second wave will be less because if you see that you know by mid march we had so many cases but they were the exposures which were happening from february probably so you know we saw them much later so anticipation was of course uh, not there we had too much confidence in our resources uh, which we didn't have to tackle so many patients thousand patients coming needing ventilation was just impossible to handle 
it's really great that you volunteered to be to work and <laughs> you and fantastic actually can i, I always uh, felt it's better me than an orthopedic surgeon <laughs> can i give one pay, uh, question for you yeah uh, are you operating with the loops and if if yes. how do you protect yourself with the hoods and visors and visors and uh, prp so that's a really good question because uh, the the n95 mask which i showed you which is the duck bill mask is actually the most comfortable mask to wear with loops uh, if you wear the blue mask it's it's extremely difficult after few hours at least in that's the experience we have had now between three of us at least so uh, if you can get a softer mask it is better you can wear loops on that very easily so that's not a problem but the only issue is you cannot wear a visor because if you wear a visor your optics are going to get uh, affected now if you are if you are doing aortic valve or mitral valve you probably don't need it the only time you will need it is with cabg and honestly i did the cabg in that patient when i didn't know he's covid positive so uh, none of our team luckily got tested positive later so i I think we were just lucky. Do you take any prophylaxis, hydroxychloroquine, or is yeah. this does anybody use that? No, nobody actually. I Means uh, this was widely discussed uh, at that point, but uh, everyone here resisted from anything like that, and thankfully so because as we know now that some early data. Of course, these are not very uh, robust clinical data, but I would say today observational data that hydroxychloroquine is not effective or maybe dangerous. uh although there has been only one case reported with tosa de pontes not many but still there's a risk um and no other technically means i am i am still surprised that my antibodies came zero uh because three of my colleagues came positive four of my fellows came positive two of my patient came positive his wife came positive and two of my close friends i managed to uh go and see them in the night uh, in new york when they were short of breath and take them to hospital then they realized i am not wearing a mask either came positive so i think hopefully my bcg vaccine is working so is, what is the percentage of uh, um, doctors who are positive 50? so the emergency room uh, in the first week around 20% staff uh, became sick uh, which was very high Uh, but uh, since then the total percentage has means overall hospital staff and when i say hospital staff that also includes janitors staff uh, you know caterers everyone it's actually less than 0.5% so as we try to come to a new normal or whatever the new normal uh is it as advisable to suspend the elective cbgs for the time being and how how many times we will we should do the testing of uh, patients for elective operations in right. future so what is really important is two things about the nasal swab is one is uh, when it becomes positive say somebody is infected and is that person infectious so these two are critical things so if you get exposed to a virus today it roughly takes around 48 hours to get positive that's the one problem and the second is you start getting infectious from that 48 hours till the symptomatic phase and then few days after symptoms and then it starts going down so i think the reasonable approach yesterday we uh, one of my colleagues actually took survey from all the big universities in us uh, where our fellows are and the policy at present is slightly different in every hospital i'm just going to give you a summary of that because it might be useful in your hospital it says uh, most of them are testing the nasal swab at least 48 hours 24 hours or on the day of the admission so we are doing it on the day of the admission but not more than 48 hours for sure uh, that's one second thing is the centers who are doing the swabs 48 hours are also repeating the swab on day of admission so that's important so if you are doing one 48 hours before you will do another swab on the day of admission post operatively assuming the swabs were negative you will do a routine swab two days after unless of course patient develops a sign of you know covid and etc like in my patient and then patient will be essentially getting a swab at time of discharge so 
the reason for that being if patient was negative at the time of discharge and later becomes positive most likely it is community acquired and that's our assumption uh, at any point if patient becomes positive now if the patients are in the tier 2 and 3 and if they become positive either 48 hours before or on the day of surgery then we we postpone their operation for 7 days repeat the swab and follow the same rigmarole again i i think that is probably the most logical way of doing it and it may be i may be wrong there but no, probably no. this yes is. yes understand and uh, nobody knows yet what is what is correct not correct logical scientific uh, because the things are unfolding by itself and every day the new rules and regulations are coming Uh, one more question i would like to ask here as a surgeon is uh, if somebody is asymptomatic if somebody is still a carrier and if somebody we have to do an operation and uh, and uh, and uh, he becomes positive after that are you taking any special consent before the operation so that's a very very good question so i think what we are t- currently discussing is we discuss with the patients uh, possible risk of getting covid in the hospital because you know in us is a litigation atmosphere etc but more importantly so that the patient also understands if they really want to go through that they may get look most of our patients are elderly and they have cardiovascular risk now these two have been shown in covid to have high mortality so we discuss and we document that we have discussed with the patient uh and uh, we make it clear we don't have a official consent process for that but it essentially will stand in court of law that we have discussed the risks and possibility of getting covid based on our current experience uh, that's what the graph i showed you you know tier 1 tier 2 uh, dr bapad uh, on a slightly different note you mentioned that uh, after your tavis you are discharging your patients uh, on day 1 i'm assuming you are doing your tavis under conscious sedation with yes. tee guidance not tee uh some patients have had it under tee under ga uh, for different reasons uh, the main reason being either they were renal failure and we didn't get a cat scan before to see the size uh, uh so some of these patients have been discharged on the same day but i think what happens in united states in many times patients just stay next door in the hospital <laughs> so when i said discharge it's a, i would still say we are comfortable in discharging them next day rather than the same day the, the reason i ask that is because with you know just with te there is more risk of aerosol uh, yes, you know correct transmission correct. so i would imagine you would try your best to avoid that during this uh, covid pandemic compl- if someone yeah yeah so we had had lot of discussions on that actually you touched a very good point uh, because that was the first case when we did the tavi restarted was something similar uh, after a heated discussion in our group it is always heated in a sense in a very friendly way uh, i think dr leon said something really nice and he said in the end that look you want to do the tavi in this patient don't change what you do normally so if you think te is essential then take precautions and do te so simple as that so he said the re- the day you compromise you will have a annular rupture and now you will have to do open chest and now the patient will be there for 10 days so do t and actually we have stuck to that we haven't changed our practice as such in doing a case i just want a yeah. hypothetical question vinayak but uh, uh, may after 6 months or 8 months or a year um, uh, and the things are settling coming up settling coming up and there is a waxing and waning and going up and down of this number of the cases uh, as a doctor as a patient um, if it if it comes to you and then uh, if i do an antibodies mm-hmm. and if the antibodies are positive but that does not rule out i am not a carrier right so so you can i i i showed that slide really quickly but essentially at some point in the disease spectrum you you will you may have nasal swab positive as well as antibody positive at yes. early response uh, so that that point you are you are not safe as an operator so to speak for a non covid patient or a covid patient is not safe for a non covid doctor but usually by 3 weeks if you look at the data which has come from china especially 
most people have negative nasal swabs anything between 7 days to 30 days and that is the time you start developing igg antibodies so you i think if your antibodies are positive and swab is negative you should be fine so but suppose my swab is negative because swab is taken from one place which may sure. not be uh, representative of my positivity or not that right but uh, usually when you have a good titer of igg uh, that means that your point of exposure was at least 3 weeks or 4 weeks before yes so if your igg titer the test we do here has a titer of say 300 oh, plus uh, then your your viral load has already come down a lot because your symptoms have gone and now you have good that, igg that is for me yes but not for the not for the community or other people uh, it's very true but the chance of you disseminating a virus at that point when you have a very good igg titer is uh, and uh, one nasal swab so mass general for example uh, mandates two negative nasal swabs before the staff comes back to work right so maybe you should do two swabs and antibody when people come back to work See, some of the hospitals here in India have suspended uh, elective uh, surgeries. Do you think uh, we should uh, continue with that or uh, we need to uh, sort of get in uh, elective surgeries as and when? I think it, it entirely depends upon where you are in terms of that graph. Uh, my observation of India has been there have not been a lot of cases now. Whether that's because there's less testing is one question. You know, because if you look at testing in US, there are more, more cases because there are more tests done as well. So if you do 10 million, you know, tests, then you're getting 3 million positive. But if you do only 1 million, then you're, you won't know. So I think the main question is, at present, for example, I hear that uh, Mumbai and Pune have a lot of cases. Uh, I think one should not do elective case uh, because if by chance you you do a straightforward case like mine and get a stroke and everything, then it becomes a big uh, uh, you know issue for you you know why did we do the case? So I think judging from where you are and how many cases are there, one can tailor that three graphs. I think of urgent case, uh, emergency, urgent, and elective. And then they decide whom to do. Okay. Great. I don't. I don't see any other uh, questions. Uh, Dr. Ajit Kumar and Dr. Mule, any closing comments? We have about uh, five more minutes uh, remaining on this clock for the meeting. Um, uh, if there is any further question, I think. Uh, 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 Ajit sir, I would, uh, Ajit sir, I would like to have a question. Yeah, please. Is there any protocol on use of CT scan in uh, rolling in or rolling out a COVID case uh, in New York City? Are no, you utilizing there, CT scan? No, we are not utilizing. It's a very good question. And we initially thought actually that even a couple of our colleagues who came positive, uh, you know, whether they should. The problem is, you know, the yield in the CT scan is very minimal. And uh, uh, you can probably make out some early change. The, the issue is, if anybody goes in the CT scan, they have to clean the whole room and the machine later. So it's logistically became a misuse of resources, actually. So maybe that is the main reason we haven't done it. And so, you are putting the other group in big, tri a big trouble. Correct, correct, correct. So, you know, I think there has been, as I said, you know, we have to use whatever resources we have in a very irrational way. Uh, because, for example, TE probe, you know, you have to clean it later properly, et cetera, because you can't do TEs in everyone uh, as, as before. We, we have to just be logical about it. Just the last point in this, as Vinayak rightly said, that we have to use the resources as good as possible. Uh, I think uh, many times the desaturation of these patients is much faster and before even the radiological signs come up on the on the CT scan or on the X-ray. And if we ask these patients to walk for 
two minutes or one minute in front of you and they desaturate, then I think there is more significant than uh, doing CT scan on everybody. Right. The other question also is, what do you do after that? Uh, means that is a means to be very honest. That has been the main impetus why not to over investigate is even if you see that you are going to treat their clinical condition. Uh, and I, I have seen now patients whose X-ray looks really bad, but they are sitting on the floor uh, with high flow nasal oxygen. And there are other patients whose X-ray looks improving and they actually have to be reintubated. So there has been a lot of discrepancies in the findings. And you know, you may be right that CT scan is a better objective measurement, but at present, yeah. the number of patients we have, it's impossible. See, I, I asked this question to Dr. Gulati also, that this discrepancy between CT scan and saturation, is it related to what is now going on as the pathogenesis of so-called microvascular thrombi? No, and have you done yeah. a perfusion imaging in these patients okay. to see what exactly is the perfusion of the lamps? So we haven't done anything at present because again, the focus currently is on a lot of trials which are on uh, treatment based rather than pathogenesis. Uh, and uh, the, the main and the simple reason for that again has been critical condition of these patients. Uh, Do heparin or, uh, or anticoagulation? Yeah, yeah, most, uh, most patients do. But just imagine Hello. taking a COVID positive patient from an isolated negative room to a, for a perfusion scan. <laughs> the logistics of going through corridors, elevators, rooms, uh, I, it, uh, it, that is the, I think it's more of a practical reason why it has not been done more than anything else. But uh, you may be right that that's what we need to do. Great. Dr. Nandomar, you, you, you will be having the last. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. The, oh, it has been a nice exposure to all various aspects of uh, COVID and uh, how we deal with and the present situation and what is going to be in the future. And especially in the role of, uh, I mean, uh, when to do surgery, what's the plan and what we are expecting in the next few weeks. It's been a great pleasure of, uh, of having both of you, uh, Dr. Galati um, and Dr. Vinayak Bapad. We really enjoyed your talk and it has been very informative and in the current context, it is very, very useful. Thank you all. And thanks Thank for all, Dr. Ajit uh, and all, all, the, uh, all the people who participated in this, uh, uh, in this uh, webinar and all those who have been actively involved in asking questions. Thank you all on behalf of uh, the society for Heart failure and transplantation, I thank you all. Thank you very much. And have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Anwar. Thanks, Dalla. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bapak.